even at the age of 15, Sam would take the time every day when I'd come home from work to sit down and we'd talk. We'd talk about work, we'd talk about what happened at school. Uh, we had a very open relationship. And Samantha just loved making people happy and having fun. She was a really good kid. I got a phone call uh, that woke me up and the nurse said that she was a nurse at Seaway Hospital. I need to come to the hospital that Samantha is unresponsive. I asked her what she meant by that and she said she couldn't tell me any further. I just needed to come to the hospital. And they're called club drugs because they became popular in the club scene. Uh, they're called designer drugs because basically they're designed for a specific high. They are created by underground chemists in conditions that are unsafe and unsanitary. They are substances that are listed as a controlled substance and then they're altered. The biggest misperception about these drugs is that they're safe. The fallacy is that they're soft drugs, that there are no ramifications. Because it's a pill, it's not harmful, there's going to be no long-term effects. And I can remember one kid walking up to me and he said, you know, where do you have a problem with kids that want to just kiss each other and not shoot each other? Where do you have a problem with a narcotic that creates peace within a community? If it's that, if it feels that good and it does that much good for the community, then how can it be bad? And that's the problem you're fighting with uh, designer drugs. I got introduced to ecstasy at a New Year's Eve party when I was probably about 16 or 17 years old. Ecstasy is a type of amphetamine, it's a type of speed. The effect is a twofold effect. The first effect is the amphetamine effect, which like any other speed, uh, diet pills from years ago, that rapid eye movement, excessive energy, the wanting to constantly talk, constantly be active, that's the amphetamine side. That is not the high that the users are after. The users are after that second high. And that second high is called a serotonin high. What's going to happen in about 40 to 60 minutes, you're going to start to feel a euphoric -y feeling. It gives people a sense, a false sense, you know, that this is really something that's not as dangerous as what it seems. It, it lures you in. Most of these club drugs that we're talking affect the chemistry of the brain. The chemistry of the brain is an important process where the way we remember things or the way we do things, our chemicals are released in the brain and they act on nerves that instruct us in how to think, how to act, how to move muscles. When you eat, sleep, feel tired, feel sexually active, these are dictated by these chemicals that come out of your brain. To put it into a nutshell, you have, first of all, you have the immediate problems of dehydration and hyperthermia. Basically, your body's overheating because what ecstasy does is it does a few biological things to your body. First, it kicks up your heartbeat to about 200 beats a minute. It kicks your blood pressure up to 230 over 130. When you're dancing and you're jumping around, you, your body gets really, really hot. So you you almost feel like you're you're boiling in your own skin. You could get a body temperature from 104 degrees all the way up to 115 degrees. Your body is being consumed by the temperature. It's causing breakdown of the muscle. It's causing breakdown of the heart. The breaking down. So your whole body is being drained by this high temperature. It's like driving a car without water. You drive the car without water, the engine's going to seize. You can have seizures. You can have a stroke. You can have bleeding in the brain. The one serious side effect of long-term use of ecstasy is it causes permanent brain damage, mostly affecting the ability to uh, recall or have memory problems. I would like to say that I have a brain tumor which is incurable. I asked my, my neurosurgeon when I got um, diagnosed with this I told him about all the drugs I ever did, about what kinds of drugs I ever did, and I asked him could that have anything to do with it, and what he told me was that at the size my tumor was when they discovered it, it was probably growing for about five years, and that he could not tell me that it wasn't caused by the drugs. We do know through tests that were run at the University of Cincinnati and John Hopkins University, that long-term ecstasy users over a period of 18 months demonstrated short-term memory loss, uh, attention span was shot, and short-term new learning ability was gone. Now you've got 15 to 16-year-old kids 
that have to take their sats in a couple of years and choose a career and go to college, and they have trouble retaining material and analyzing, where are they? They're in a world of hurt because they like to party. So there's a lot more downsides to ecstasy than is known to the average person. Because they use heroin as a cut in the ecstasy tab known as a dopey, they're developing, even though, you know, kids will tell you that ecstasy isn't addictive. But what they don't tell you is that if you take enough MDMA ecstasy into your body to cause withdrawals, which is the definition of addiction, you'll be dead. But with heroin, heroin is very addictive. So consequently, the dealers know this, and that's why they will try and promote the heroin-laced pills, because they develop the taste for the heroin, and therefore, hopefully, the dealers are hoping they will get hooked to heroin. It's like a cat tranquilizer. So when your little kitty goes into the veterinarian for some surgery, this is what they'll inject into the cat to put them under so they're not feeling any pain when they're in surgery. Ecstasy is cut sometimes with special K. Ketamine causes what, in lower doses, it causes a euphoria or out-of-body experience. You might hallucinate. You're not acting normal or aware of your surroundings. These are the reasons why some people take it, but at a higher dose, you can stop your breathing. And certainly when you stop your breathing, you're in serious problem. You're going to die. But the first time I used it, I passed out for a few minutes. I think a lot of times most people do um, when they use it on its own like that. Because, I mean, we're not doctors. We don't know what, how much we should take or how much we shouldn't. You can take too much of it and go into what they call a K-hole. When you go into a K-hole, you literally go into a, a, a coma-type situation. You might not know where you are. You can't think coherent because you're seeing hallucinations. If you were in a K-hole right now, I could slap you, I could put ice cubes on your neck, I could, I could jump you up and down, and you would not feel a thing until that high wore off, you are out of the picture, you are down for the count. Being that it's an anesthetic, you can anesthetize yourself to the point where you may not wake up. You know, and your friends around you are using too, nobody's gonna know to send you out for help or that you need help and chances are that nobody's gonna call for an ambulance or anything because you're doing something illegal, you know? It's very easy to overdose, very easy. Rohypnol is a drug that is a tranquilizer. Roofies are not manufactured in the United States. They're highly illegal here because they were being abused for the date rape. It is the common perception that, oh, it's a legal substance, it's just like Valium. One Rohypnol is like taking 10 Valiums. It has a strength of 10 Valiums. When it's abused on the street, it is another date rape drug because it will knock you out and keep you knocked out for quite a long period of time. The way it works is it makes you forget the events while you're under the influence of the drug. It causes amnesia. You will have no memory of anything that's going on. You'll wake up and not know where you were. Um, you'll wake up and have no memory of anything that took place. This is extremely dangerous. It's extremely scary. These 14, 15, you know, little high school kids, they go off to these places. These are very shady places. You don't know you're going to come across. Um, I've had friends that were near sexu nearly sexually assaulted in these places. Because it's tasteless, because it's odorless, because it dissolves easily, no one will know. Never share bottles of water. You know, at raves and at parties, bottles of water are constantly passed around. A good rule of thumb is never accept a drink from someone you don't know or someone who just gives you a drink. You get pedophiles and just really sick people that go there because they know that it's going to draw a young kids and these kids are going to be screwed up and anything can happen you know it's so dangerous you could wake up after being raped and you know your clothes are all back on maybe they're not on correctly and by now the drugs leaving your system by the time you go to a hospital or a physician or the police the drug has left your system you have no memory of what happened so if you don't get to a rape kit the first day immediately you have no proof the drug was used. So if you can't identify the attacker and you have no proof that the drug was used, who are you gonna arrest? <laughs> Meth is becoming a huge problem. It's, it's becoming the drug of choice in a lot of areas of the country. It stimulates, it hypes you up, and what that can do is lead to violent behavior or aggressive behavior or a dangerous behavior. Uh, it basically puts you up uh, like crack would. It increases energy, it decreases appetite. The effect of it is to get you into a serious car accident or serious trauma or 
something that you, not, you would not normally do, maybe jump from a window, because it has that stimulus effect. It's on the rise now because it's being mixed with the ecstasy. You might get a pill that's ecstasy and meth. You might have someone tell you it's just ecstasy and really it's methamphetamine. If someone has an underlying heart problem, it could speed up their heart because it's elevating your mood, it's putting that energy into your body. You don't know what other things it can affect in your body. And if it's mixed with other substances, the same thing. There could be, you know, such a high dose that you just can't calm down. You can overdose on methamphetamine, you can overdose on all of these drugs. They all have potential serious side effects affecting the heart, affecting the brain with seizures, sometimes affecting the breathing process. You have emergency room uh, physicians that have no clue what is wrong with the, all they know is this kid is totally disoriented, uh, is experiencing all of the symptoms of heavy uh, intoxication, but there's liquor uh, or alcohol in the system. When you go to one of these parties or someone slips you a drink with some unknown drug in it, or someone gives you a pill that says, try this, and you come to the emergency room with serious problems, you can't breathe, your heart rate is slow, you're sick, I don't always know what's the best route because I don't know what medicine you're taking and it becomes a challenge to me to try to save your life. The doctor came in and said that Samantha was unresponsive. Uh, again, I asked, what do you mean she's unresponsive? And he said, your daughter is brain dead. Well, I asked, what happened? Was she in a car accident? You know, which is what causes most, you know, traumatic situations like this for kids. And he said, no. They thought that she'd been slipped GHB. GHB, or gamma hydroxybutyrate, is a chemical or drug that people use at rave parties. They also use it in other circumstances, too. First of all, let's understand what's in GHB. There's three precursors. The first precursor is a GBL, which is gamma butyral lactone, which is the stuff that's in paint stripper. When You know when you open up paint stripper, that, that candy, that smell that hits you, that's GBL. Then uh, ethanol, which is basically alcohol, and sodium hydroxide, which is caustic acid, it's drain cleaner. Think about using Drano in your kitchen sink. Well, that's what's going into your body when you use something like GHB. The problem is at higher doses, GHB can be deadly. Because now it creates a comatose, short-term memory loss state, which lasts from two to seven hours. And this is where it gets its name, the date rape drug. Just a little bit is all you need to um, put into someone's drink. If they have a reaction to it, it can cause death. It's colorless, odorless, and almost tasteless. It has a slight bitter taste. It dissolves instantly into, into a liquid, which doesn't necessarily have to be liquor. Have it in water, or in Samantha Reed's case, she'd simply drank some in Mountain Dew. She was over watching videos with some high school kids who thought it would be a lot of fun to get the girls, in their words, a little more frisky. So they fed them GHB. Melanie had asked for a screwdriver. Uh, Samantha and Jessica said they'd have a Mountain Dew. So Nick, Dan, and Josh went into the kitchen and poured the girls a drink. They took the drink back into the living room and gave them to the girls. And Samantha took a sip of her Mountain Dew and said, this doesn't taste like Mountain Dew. It tastes a little funny. Well, Melanie had taken a sip of her, what she thought was a screwdriver, and said, um, well, I, I have a screwdriver, and so Samantha says, well, here, taste mine. It doesn't taste like Mountain Dew. So Melanie took a drink of Samantha's and said, well, I think that's vodka in there. So Samantha went ahead and drank the Mountain Dew with what she thought had now vodka in it. Um, after drinking the drink, Melanie said that Samantha just looked like she laid on the couch and went to sleep. Josh had said that he poured a little bit into the orange juice, he poured a little bit of GHB into one of the Mountain Dews, and he went to pour a little bit into the other Mountain Dew, and it kind of slipped, and he poured more than he should have into that Mountain, the, the second Mountain Dew. But they just went ahead and served the drinks to the girls anyway. So it was a 50-50 chance, and Samantha got the Mountain Dew that um, had enough GHB in it to kill eight grown men. It's a very, very dangerous 
underreported drug. When someone's on the LSD, they'll think that they're hearing colors and seeing sound, so it reverses everything that's going on in your brain. Acid takes every reality that you have and totally distorts it. LSD is usually on like blotter paper, a certain type of paper, and they'll put it under their tongue for the acid to be absorbed. After you trip on acid one time, you, you question everything about everything you've ever thought in your life. If you're mixing LSD with methamphetamine or ecstasy, it can increase your heart too much, um, where your heart can just not take it anymore. You will have what is called a bad trip, and um, I've, I've talked, you know, I talked to people out of killing themselves because they just didn't know what to do with themselves. Oxycontin is a very widely abused drug on the street. The actual name of the, of the drug itself is oxycodone. It's in a lot of products such as Percocet and uh, uh, other other pain reducing uh, formulas which are prescriptions if you're taking say a 40 milligram oxy which is what it's called in the street it's like taking eight percocets in one shot and again i mean unless you know you were uh an oxy cotton user and you know exactly how much you can and can't take if you're if you're a young kid and you're saying hey this makes me feel good how easy is it to take too much also it creates an addiction uh which again like i said people will start taking it for pain relief become addicted to it, the doctors will realize this, shut off their prescriptions, and now you have people turning to heroin or methadone. We show pictures to the kids of where this stuff is made, and I mean, you're talking about dirty sheds, unprotected, no gloves, chemicals just thrown all over the place. I've been in underground labs. I've been in street labs. Basically, it's mixed up in sinks and bathtubs, and by who, you don't know. I mean, you go in these places, there's bugs, and rats and dirt and filth everywhere. And you see this stuff with the skull and crossbones on the label, that's the stuff they're filling in and using in these pills. You could be getting a pill that's 50% heroin. You could be getting a pill that contains six substances in it, including DXM, caffeine, um, LSD, you never know. There's no imprint that says, oh, this is a certain milligram or a certain strength. It's really what's concocted in the kitchen how much is mixed in, how much is put together, what impurities, what toxic other medi medications or drugs are in there. You don't have a clue. What are you putting in your body? You don't know? The guy that sold it to you doesn't know. The only one that knows is the Looney Tunes that made it over in the Netherlands, and you better hope he was in a good mood that day. This information on the web can be a real danger because it's designed, it looks good, it sounds good, it seems like it has medical authority or medical research on it. These websites look like some kind of you know, big corporation would put on there. It's all written by people that take drugs. They can get information on what pills are the sh rated the strongest. They have like these polls that kids log on these websites and say, oh, these pills are the best or these pills are the best. But these are websites that are sometimes put together by people who just want to sell the drugs or want to give inf misinformation about them. They are not medically tested to see if the information is reliable. It's a whole group. It's a, it's a whole new clique. They feel it is legitimate and that they don't feel like it's so illegal and they feel like it's okay because it's accepted among each other. I was at a party and four kids died at this party. The rave scene has been known to host a lot of these club drugs. Fifty people crammed on one little couch, everybody's rubbing each other's hair and scratching each other. I mean, it, it's really a sight. In the rave culture, there's a word called plur, which means peace, love, unity, respect. And this is the culture which they feel is, it's a music, it's about them, everybody is part of it. But of all the raves I've been to, and I've been to a ton of them, I will guarantee you at any given time, 60 to 80 percent of those people that are in that rave are rolling or are stoned. There's a misconception that the raves are the only places these designer drugs are being used, and that simply isn't true. You're going to find them any place. You could find them at your local school. You could find them in your community. If you ask most teenagers who have experimented or use these types of substances, 
could pretty much get it anywhere. However, it is important to know that if you are caught in possession or using these substances, you will get the same penalties as a class one, schedule one narcotic. That is a felony. It is illegal, it's zero tolerance in the United States. And that felony charge, you gotta remember, can carry anywhere from three to five years in jail. These are charges that are gonna carry with you for the rest of your life. Wherever you go, that felony charge will be there. I see kids come in with overdoses after taking these drugs. They are very ill. Some of them manage to live and tell about it and sometimes realize how serious their problem was. Some don't. You gotta think about who else you're hurting, not just yourself. You have to think about your family at home who might not know where you are, your friends who are out with you and have no idea what happened to you. The doctor came in and he asked me to go see her. He says, you need to go see her right now. Samantha had um, been hooked to a life support machine. She had a tube down her throat. And her hair was a big mess. She had a big bump on her head from where they dropped her. Tried to carry her out of the house. She was stiff and she was cold. Her hair clip was still in her hair. So I took her hair clip out and I combed her hair. I told her she'd be okay. She's a strong little girl. She'll make it through. And I kissed her on the cheek and covered her up. Her little feet were sticking out, so I covered them up. And that machine just pumping away, keeping her lungs going. And, um... Samantha didn't make it. She died 18 hours later after being hooked up to this machine. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I, I was never going to do it either. You know, I was just going to do it and try it one time just for the experience of it. And from trying it one time, it's okay for me to do this once a week. And then from doing it once a week, it's okay to do it twice a week. And then from twice a week, you find yourself sitting in your apartment, blockading your windows and your doors and, you know, not answering the telephone. You know, hell, just turn the thing off and, you know, eat pills all day, have conversations with yourself in the mirror. And, you know, that's, that's just a live life. The one thing I would say is if anyone's considering or thinking about using these drugs is really sit and think it through. Don't sit there and take it because you're getting sucked into using it because your friends are. Watch who you associate with. Um, if you know that kid is a bad apple, you know he deals with club drugs or any type of designer drugs, watch out for him. You have the right to say no. The problem is that too many educators talk down to kids. You have to talk to the kids. You have Here's the real deal. This is what it's all about. If in your mind you say to yourself, well, I don't want to take the chance on winding up like this kid on the video, then you have to express yourself. You are an individual. You are you. No one else is you. And that's what we try and get across to the kids. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll reach some of them that just won't go with the flow and go with what the crew does. Hopefully, some will think for themselves, and those are the kids we want to talk to. I feel very blessed. I feel very blessed out of this and all I have is a brain tumor um, that may be able to be attributed to it because it could be so much worse. You know, I know so many people that are doing so much worse than I am right now. Like dead, you know. Too many kids, too many. Samantha wrote a lot of poetry and she wrote a poem about dying before your time called What If? I miss her dearly and I, I just need to be alone. I go out to the cemetery and uh, I rub my hand on the headstone and uh, read her poem that's out there. I always thought that when it came, I'd be ready for the end. By that time, I'd be resigned and tame. Death would appear a welcome friend. But what if I still want to live, still want to learn and grow? What if I still have gifts to give? and I'm not yet ready to go? What if I'm too young still, not old enough to die? What if I want to wait until I've experienced life before I say goodbye?